St. Joseph, Light of Patriarchs, pray for us. The Litany of St. Joseph on EWTN. EWTN. Live true. Live Catholic. Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, is our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. family. We got a lot of family here tonight from various parts of the country. And I thought tonight we would speak about anger. I have nobody here ever gets angry. <laughs> uh, apparently our, our Christianity demands humility. We don't like to talk too much about that virtue, you know. It, uh, it demands compassion, demands that you love and pray for your enemy. And we don't like that too much either. Um, and so we, we do have today a kind of cafeteria Catholics and Christians all over the world. And, and the reason is that uh, we pick and choose, see? Now, you, what, I think you're going to say, well, Mother, isn't there such a thing as just anger? Oh, well, yeah. There are just wars, too, but let's take an example of just anger and the different degrees of anger. I think that'd be a good subject. You think that's a good subject? Because I don't know anybody that doesn't get angry. Now, some people, uh, they seem to be born angry. I mean, they're kicking and screaming from day one. <laughs> and they never get over it, you know? And if you say something to them, they say, well, that's the way I was made. Applesauce. <laughs> Nobody was made angry. Sometimes we're angry over pride. You know, somebody said, oh, where'd you get that dress? Like, eh, your taste is not too hot. So what happens? You flush and you want to kill <laughs> You work all day and you make a good meal and your husband comes home and he says, oh, we, we've had that for three days. See, he's been so absorbed in his work, he didn't know, you know this is his first day this week. <laughs> he probably remembers the four days last week. <laughs> and so what do you do? You're angry. Uh, your husband works very hard. He's looking for that raise. He's looking for that promotion. And some young whippersnapper comes in, has a couple degrees hanging off his name, and he gets promoted. Angry. 
Sometimes we get angry over things that happen in the world, in the government, in society. And what makes us angry? Well, we read a little news. We add a lot to it. It's like trying to cover garbage with more garbage. We come to some kind of conclusion, which probably isn't right, and then we're angry. You can get angry because it rains. I mean, now that's a dumb thing to get angry over, but you can get angry at your dentist because not only does he fill your mouth with <laughs> all kinds of things, but he's got all kind of music on that you don't like. <laughs> and then he talks to you besides. <laughs> and he expects you to answer. How are you? Hi, <laughs> hi, well, By the time you get an angry fit before you're off the chair. See, well, <clears throat> <laughs> I'm not against uh, dentists or doctors, but I mean, or, oh, doctors, wow. You go and you wait in a waiting room. You have an appointment for 1 o'clock, 1 .30, 2. Here comes somebody at 10 to 2. Mrs. Smith? <laughs> You watch him going in, like. <laughs> I don't believe this. You know? Here she comes in, 10 of. Kind of a good looking gal, too. She comes in, 10 of. And you've been sitting two hours. How you feel about that? Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. It's amazing how God gives me answers. <laughs> but all of these things are occasions of anger. Now perfectionists, they have the worst because everything that happens they're mad about because it isn't right, you see. Then we got the sloppy people. You wish they'd get angry. <laughs> You'd wish that something would happen that they would show some kind of emotion. That happens to you wives. Your husband comes in and he begins to take off his coat drops it, takes off his tie, drops it, takes off his shoes, drops it, takes off his stockings, drops it. You know just where he came, <laughs> and you know just where he went. Now, it isn't like you haven't told him 500 times. So you go up to him and you say, are you deaf? No. Why can't you put all of your stuff at least in one pile? Because I'm hot. Oh. Now what happens? You got a fight coming on. See, Ivy, you got a good family fight. If you were Italian, boom. <laughs> Now there, in Italy, in Italians, you find real solid anger. An Italian wife would pick up everything from the door and wrap it around his neck. <laughs> and say, now, see how you feel when you take it off in your bedroom. See, that's all occasions of anger. Now, what should you do? This is just one form of anger. There are many forms of anger. This is one form, which is kind of daily life. A week ago, on and have fun with it till midnight. What do you do with it? That's the problem. Now, the first thing is, is to supernaturalize it. And you're going to say, she's nuts. She's been in the monastery too long. <laughs> Ooh, 
no. In the monastery, too, we have needles and we have sloppies. <laughs> See, so it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter. The problem is, do I see an opportunity from God himself to change me? Now, our problem is where, this is the real problem. We want to change them. Did you notice that? Huh? You want your husband to pick up everything. So you want to have everybody have the impeccable taste you think you have when they buy a dress or whatever it is. See, I, I have a hard time with somebody who wears a green uh, coat with red trousers and a blue tie. I mean, I, I think, did they look at a mirror? See? Now, I could get angry over that and say, but why would you do that? See, this is an occasion now, see, for me, for you, whatever it is, to examine your own conscience and say, oh, Lord, it looks strange, but only to me. That kind of apparel uh, looks good to them. So what would be the occasion of anger in me? I have to examine my conscience of that, but why am I getting angry? Is this thing I'm getting angry over worth it? Is it worth losing my peace over? Is it worth losing my joy? Is it worth offending God? Nothing is worth offending God. Is it worth decreasing the glory, my glory in heaven so I can glorify God so much more? Is this re See, we get mostly get angry over very little things. It's really not a good sign. It's a sign of a lack of control, self-control. See, I need to change. See, I have to allow my imperfect brother to be imperfect. Now, that's real love. That's how God loves him. See, and you don't see the Lord coming in your living room and saying to your husband, John, pick this stuff up. See, both of you miss an occasion for real solid virtue. One is that you shouldn't throw it down. The other thing, pick it up lovingly. I say, are you nuts? No. That's the good book here, see? And if you don't follow this, you end up one miserable human being. And the more you change, the more loving and kind and compassionate, and not just putting up with people, not just enduring them, but looking upon them as occasions for my soul to be reshaped, reformed into the image of Jesus. Look at the awesome patience our dear Lord had with the apostles. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And see, you and I as Christians, as human beings, as men and women, you and I must live up to the purpose God had in mind when he created you. You're not a, a grain of sand on the seashore. See? It means I must change. And that's why we have such strange ideas of justified anger. If somebody invades a country, you have a right to fight back. You have a right to protect yourself. If, if something happens to your family, say your son or your daughter got on drugs or alcohol, anything, well, you can feel very sorry and you can feel anger. But if you don't handle it correctly, you make the situation worse. And, and some of you know that. Does it mean if you're very nice and, and loving with them, they, you condone it? No, you always have to tell them, this is not right. 
Right now you have people, I think, are being led astray by justified anger. See? They think if you kill an abortion doctor, you, you've done something great. Not so. You see, no matter what anybody does wrong, you have to forgive and pray for them. Murder for murder is never right. And I would hate any of you pro-lifers who have such a high calling to, to do something so wrong. It, it makes all pro-lifers look like they're some kind of terrible type of people who, who get violent. Violence never cures or heals more violence, see? Never does. Anger does not create gentleness in someone else. Anger creates more anger. And so you, you can't, the, the, the Old Testament eye for an eye and truth for truth is, is misinterpreted today. You know what that meant in those days? It was really an act of charity. If you came to me and I was an Old Testament little Jewish girl and you stole my cow, I couldn't go and burn your house down. I could just go and steal one of your cows. I could get my cow back and take one of yours. It's an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. I, it was an act of charity to keep people from being violent over little things. But tonight, most Christians are make wonderful Old Testament Jews. Because you think unless you have feelings, it's nothing. You think if God doesn't bless you with health, wealth, and wisdom, it's nothing. Then you don't have a God that loves you. See, we, 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 we have misinterpreted the good book. And see, I must be moral on my own, in my own life. See, the state has a right to make decisions about what happens to a, a man who commits murder or whatever. But see, in our lifetime, we cannot, we cannot repay murder for murder, stealing for stealing, anger for anger, because then there is no Christianity left. I have to, according to this book, I have to forgive my enemy. I have to pray for him, and I have to love him. See, it doesn't mean I'm going to love him the, the way you love your husband or the way you love your children, but loving means I wish him well. I wish him a change of heart. I wish him in the kingdom. See, the beautiful thing about Maria Goretti, who was martyred because she wanted to keep her chastity, this young man was trying to rape her, and she fought so hard, he stabbed her, I think, 40-some times. And she said, I forgive you. And one day, I want you with me in the kingdom. Oh, that's what you call Christianity. And he did. He repented, entered a monastery, and he was there at her canonization, along with her mother. And her mother forgave him. So forgiveness obtained the grace of conversion. And if, if we don't understand that, then everything that goes wrong in our country, in the world, in the church, instead of defining and defending, which is different, we will be so angry that inside something awesome happens to us. Something terrible, see? Our soul becomes the same as the one I hate. I read a sentence one time on a retreat, and it said, uh, you are what your thoughts are. Did you ever notice that? Huh? You can't hide everything. Well, I can hide it. Oh, come on. The first thing it shows it is your eyes. Some people get angry, they get beady eyes. You ever see that? They go like this. 
And as soon as you see those beady eyes, you know, woo, watch out. <laughs> they go like that. <laughs> see, even your face changes when you're angry for, for something that doesn't really matter a hoot. See, our whole being is created by God for God. And if I don't use everything that I am in, in that way, for that purpose, then it's going to show. Did you ever see a loving, angry person? No? Boy, my grandfather used to get mad. I could hear him across the street. Was he being gentle? No. What was he mad about? Because my Uncle Pete wouldn't get up. <laughs> when I was a kid, I never needed an alarm clock. At six o'clock prompt, my grandfather would say, Pietro, oh, time to get up. Sharp, 6 a.m. And that went on an hour and a half. <laughs> I mean, we did that every morning. Why well, you need a clock when we had Grandpa? So I, we off to school. Uncle Pete still wasn't up. He could have lived about 20 years longer if he had just said, let him sleep. He's not going to get up anyway. <laughs> yeah? Then, I let me tell you something about Uncle Pete. We found out years, years later, he was born. He had a congenital heart condition, see? And it was bad. He, he died uh, in a chair, and we never knew it. But see, a lot of things happened. I thought my Uncle Pete was just lazy, so did my grandfather. But I wasn't going to get mad about it, see? Why, did you ever notice when you get angry, you get so tired? I mean, why wear yourself out? And, and what happened was that probably his entire life, he was so tired in the morning, he couldn't have gotten up. And that's God's permitting will. And we, we get angry over so many little unimportant things that our whole life passes by. And we, we miss a sunrise, a sunset. We miss the beauty of a rose. We, we miss the beauty of the people we live with. And nobody's all bad. Nobody. And, and it's you and I a, a duty as Christians to bring the best out of everybody. Not to see the worst and work on it, but the very very best. Now many, many times people do very evil things, very evil things. Is that God's will? No. But the fact that he gave us all free will, then that means we can do very wonderful things, very holy things, or very bad things, very evil things. Now why does God kind of permit this mixture, you know, all together. Well, he does it for the same reason his son suffered from the same thing. Do you know what Jesus suffered from? Jealousy. He suffered, he had to put up with the jealousy. That's why they murdered him. They were just jealous. Just jealous. They didn't want him to be king. And he didn't want to be king. Uh, he suffered from the ignorance of those around him. Nobody got the point. The men he chose to follow him and to carry on his work never understood. Never understood. He had to die. He had to ride. Never understood. Never. The very people he healed. Can you imagine somebody you've grown up and healing them and they were blind and they could see and they were crippled and they could walk and, and then when you needed somebody to get up there and, and protect you or, or to stand for you, they were gone. I think that happens today. 
How many people defend our Lord? When I defended, when we defended the, the terrible movie called The Last Temptation of Christ, you know, and I went from coast to coast, I got terrible letters from people who were angry because I was defending the Lord. And they're all Christian. Uh, I don't understand that, see? See, we, we can defend, but not get so angry that we kill people or slander them or calumniate them. And that's why when you forgive an injury and you are making reparation for that particular person who injured you, are there unjust things that happen to you? Oh, yeah. Time after time after time in your life, there's unjust things that happen to you. But what, what a wonderful thing it would be if we could feel the injustice and feel the pain and still forgive. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I mean, wouldn't that be a high degree of holiness? How close to God you would be at that moment. And then I can make reparations for the people who are always angry and for their action. That's how we ought to treat abortionists. Not only do we pray to save lives. See, there's a kind of mixed up idea in the world today. We, uh, we will do everything possible to save the life of a child that's three, four years old that falls in a well or needs a liver transplant. We'll, we'll do a heart surgery for people that are elderly. We do a lot of things. But then we don't think anything of destroying a life even before it's finished, you know, before God finishes creating it. I mean, what do we do? What extent do we go for whales? Whales. Deer. Dogs, cats, birds. But then we'll destroy human life and, and not think a thing of it. So what's wrong? See? Well, we're all mixed up. We'll go to a great extent to save a life, which we're supposed to. We must save life. We must promote life. We cannot go around and there's such anger, such anger on both sides. And you have to wonder, abortionists hate pro-lifers, pro-lifers hate abortionists. The, the people outside, they cry and yell and spit at people. And the, what, what's wrong? See, there's something inside of us now that's very wrong. And, and if somebody don't come along and say, hey, let's pray, not only for the women going in an abortion clinic, let's pray for the doctor, the nurses. If we don't change our hearts, then it's anger for anger, hatred for hatred. That's one of them, I think, the, one of the greatest dangers in the pro-life movement is hatred for hatred. There has to be some kind of hatred for somebody, that small little uh, helpless baby that's maybe six, five, four, five, six months old. See, there's, there's, there's some kind of hatred there, some kind of terrible, awesome desire to destroy. But if that same desire gets into you who are pro-lifers, you destroy your whole mission. Do you understand that? You destroy your entire mission, which means if occasion calls, you're ready to also kill. See, there, there's something the devil gets into, tries to get in all these wonderful movements, and, and, and you can't just hate. You can't hate. 
See, Jesus was the victim of hatred, but he never did anything to change it. In fact, he prayed that the Lord would forgive them that they don't know what they do. Okay? We, we don't know. And we don't know because we don't read this book, see? I just opened up a few little passages and we're going to go for, for calls. It says, this is the way you used to live. Greed, guilty, passion, impurity, fornication, evil desires. When you were surrounded by people doing what? The same thing. See? <laughs> That's what's happening today. Tit for tat. Getting angry, bad tempered, spiteful, Whew. abusive language, and dirty talk. Well, you think things have changed, huh? <laughs> huh? Forget it. And he said, never tell each other lies. He said, you've stripped off this old behavior. You put on a, a new self. If virtue and vice become one, then there is the death of Christianity. Why do you think the first Christians used to go into the arena with these lions coming after them and sing songs of praise to God? Would you do that? You turn around and say, Hail Caesar. <laughs> See? Because we, we've lost this. See? And, and when, there's mixed, when, there's, when there's confusion in the church about sacraments, especially the Eucharist and Our Lady, you don't have strength or light to distinguish. So you only act on emotions. When your anger becomes only an emotional thing, you're a dead duck. You are. Because you have no more control. Your rash judgment takes over. And you can be just as bad as the one you hate. Now, see, that's what our dear Lord came to teach us. This is what St. Paul says. You are God's chosen race. You're his saints. Boy, there's a lot of tarnished halos going around. <laughs> he loves you. And you've got to be clothed with kindness and humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with one another. Forgive one another as soon as a quarrel begins. I have to tell you this because I haven't said it in at least three years. There were two monks who lived in the desert. And they looked at each other one day and said, we live very well together. We pray together, but we've never been angry, so we've never forgiven each other. And the one monk said, well, what do we do? He said, well, we need to get angry. He said, well, what about? Well, he said, we'll argue over this rock. I'll say it's my rock, and you say it's your rock. He said, okay, you start. <laughs> so, okay, this is my rock. And the other one said, well, if it's yours, take it. <laughs> See? Well, I, <laughs> I think that's what St. Paul is saying here. She, he forgave as soon as the argument started. <laughs> That was the end of the argument. And you begin to realize why they got along. Let the message of Christ in all its richness find a home, if you Pro-lifers, 
if you really want to change, you really want to change this whole thing, you must pray much, love much, and pray for those who are on the wrong track. Jesus also died for them. What a terrible thing to give your life for somebody and he never even says thank you. What a terrible thing to suffer as much as Jesus suffered and have somebody said, so what? I didn't ask you to do it. How would you feel? A lot of people feel that way. Not only feel for the infant who never has a chance, Feel for the God who created the infant who will never have a chance. Feel for the man and the woman who does such a horrible, horrible thing for money. What an evil. But when evil begins to make us so angry that we become evil, then do you understand what happens to your soul? It begins to dry up. And then you're just ready for the enemy. See, now, uh, saying I had something else marked here. Uh, For those of you who have a workplace where you have a lot of problems and you have people you don't like, St. Paul says, be considerate of those who are working among you. Be at peace among yourselves and pray constantly. For all pro-lifers, Remember, it is not just the abortion issue you fight. You fight an awesome enemy. And you have to put on faith and hope and love. And you need to be men and women of deep prayer. If we don't, things will never get better only worse. We have a call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Where are you from? Houston, Texas. And what is your question? Uh, Mother, how much we enjoy your program and how many good things I've heard from it, both from Catholics and non-Catholics. Don't ever underestimate the influence you're having on this country. <laughs> Thank you. My question is, uh, uh, I'll try to make it brief. You remember in the garden when Jesus was taken by the servants of the high priest? Right. Peter struck off the ear yeah. of one of the servants. And Peter. Jesus reproved him and said, if I need anybody to do that kind of thing, we've got angels to handle. Right. You stick to your business. On the other hand, he did get angry. You remember the money changers? Yeah. And he uh, drove them out of the temple right. and whipped them. Mm -hmm. uh, today we hear much praise, and, and many of these people in the pro-life movement who think you can kill people cite the example of Count von Stauffenberg, who put a bomb in Hitler's bunker and then left and tried to blow him up. And they compare themselves to this, uh, uh, to this act, which has been widely praised. I wondered if you'd compare the two and discuss what you think of both. And thank you, Mother. I'll hang up now. Uh, our dear Lord is the only one that could have justified anger. He was not angry ever for himself. Uh, people talked against him. He'd be giving a, a beautiful talk and, and they would walk away. Uh, when everybody walked away from him, when he talked about the doctrine of, of uh, the Eucharist, uh, he wasn't angry. He had wonderful obedience to the Father's will and obedience to God. <coughs> What happened at that point? Why was Jesus really angry? That's the difference. We're always angry over something happens to us. He was angry because, and he said why he was angry, 
you have made my father's house a den of thieves instead of house of prayer. Well, that was justified anger. He didn't kill anybody. He overturned a few tables. Some people need a few wax on the head or other places in order to get something up here. Sometimes you got to shake them up to make them think. So our dear Lord's anger was justified because it was not over himself. It was because the temple of his father was being sacrilegiously treated by doves and, and lambs and everything else. And of all things, money changing. So our dear Lord had a right, not only because he was son of God, but he had a right. He had a right to anger. Now, when we use that as an excuse uh, for doing away with somebody, that is an excuse. It's a lame excuse. We're trying very hard to justify an evil deed. Now, everybody knows that in a war, the church teaches that there are justifiable wars and you have a right to defend yourself. Well, you're defending yourself, but you're also defending your country, defending morals. You can defend yourself against rape. You defend yourself against robbers. You defend yourself against somebody trying to murder you. But you must always at least first try to defend by other means. You just can't go into something making a decision that this man, this woman, this thing is evil and we got to wipe it out. Because that kind of attitude comes along and begins to wipe out good people. I don't like you now because you're black, or I don't like you because you're a Catholic, or I don't like you because you're Christian or a Muslim or a Hindu, so I don't like you, so then I have a right. You see, it's not only the thing you do, it's, the, it's what happens after you do it. The example you give, the attitude of heart. And see, that's what's happening to this country. There are some groups that say you shouldn't pray and enter in a school. And we take away prayer. See? But this country is built on freedom of religion. Now, if I have an excuse for taking away this freedom and that freedom and this freedom and that freedom, the first thing you know, you see, is an attitude is created where there is no freedom. And so we must be extremely careful and not, not zero in on only one part of the scriptures. Our Lord in that incident was justified because he was not defending himself. He was defending his father. The people had a right to a house of prayer, not a money exchange. See? That was justified. But you cannot use that action of Jesus unless the honor and glory of God is at stake. I'm sure in a war, if some of the our men knew where Hitler was, they would have bombed it. But this is a war. And we're saving ourselves from millions and millions and millions of people being killed unjustly. See, once you begin to think there is a perfect race and nobody else fits in except these few people, then you feel justified in, humil in eliminating them. That's not justified anger, that's evil. 
Now, if you say that this particular man we were talking about was defending the unborn against this doctor's actions, you cannot kill for murder. What you're saying is, I am against murder, because that's what about this doctor was about to do, commit murder. So then you commit murder. You see what I'm saying? That doctor has to answer to God. God must be his judge, and God must take care of him. But we don't pray enough for these people, I don't think. They are victims of our hatred, not of our prayers. We do not wish them salvation. We want them to go to hell. I've heard him say that. See, with that kind of attitude, maybe our prayers are not what they should be when we walk back and forth praying. We must pray that these women don't have abortion. We must pray that these doctors and nurses get light. Only that kind of light comes from God. You can't give them light by, by preaching. They, they don't believe the way you believe. Am I excusing them? No way. No way. We must pray for those two that died. We must pray because we never gave them a chance to be sorry. Do you, do you understand what happens? You, you can't snuff out somebody's life and they've never even had a chance to say, I'm sorry, Lord. This, you, you, can't, you can't do evil for evil. We have to pray for those that died and pray for those who are guilty and pray that no one else, no one else does the same thing. See, everybody is precious to God until they die and make that last bad decision. I don't want to live with you the rest of my life. That bad decision. They still is hope. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother? Yeah, will you speak a little louder, please? Hello, Mother? Yes. I'm from Nebraska. Uh-huh. What is your question? Uh, my que Well, my statement, first of all, I'd like to wish you a happy and blessed anniversary on the 15th. Well, thank you. I'll be 50 years. Right. I'm the one that's <laughs> you that Sunshine Award. Thank you. Mother? My question is this, on anger, how can a person keep from going into anger? Like if you get angry, how, why can't our Blessed Mother and our Lord say, keep us from going, you know, getting angry? Well, was there ever a time for our dear mother to be angry? It was during the, the trial, the crucifixion, to see all the apostles leave our Lord. She had umpteen occasions for anger, and so did our Lord. And yet there was not that anger. Why? Well, our Lord answered that. When, when Pilate said to Jesus, Do you not know that I have power to release you or power to crucify you? Our Lord broke his silence, and he said, No. You have no power over me unless it is given to you from above. Oh. That kept our dear Lord from being angry. He felt so sorry for Pilate. You know, Pilate committed suicide years later. Uh, it's it's a matter of knowing the will of God. And in many things, we, we have to defend ourselves and many things uh, people say about us. Uh, what does it matter? Huh? See, it doesn't change God's opinion of me. And it, that's the only thing it matters. It's the only thing that should matter to any of us. 
if we're falsely accused or calumniated or slandered, what does it matter when God knows the truth? And when you when you start, you feel that anger coming up. Stop for a second. Ask yourself, is this important enough to be angry about? And what? How am I going to be after I get angry? Can I can forgive now? Can I just just kind of hold myself a little bit and say, well, can I answer gently instead of a sharp tongue? which only makes things worse. Can I, can I really give light to somebody if I correct them, or do I correct them so harshly that they feel I don't love them anymore? See, th those are the kind of things you have to just stop for a few minutes. You know, <clears throat> virtue is painful for a short time. Long range peace. Sin is joy for a few, a short time. Long range misery. You ever notice that? Huh? <coughs> if you're honest, you'll say that's true. Because they did. You, you fornicate, and all of a sudden, your friend, your girlfriend has a baby. Your whole life is changed. You got it? See? You got good and drunk and lost your job? Oh, you, you really felt good drunk. Now you don't have a nickel. You lost your job. You told somebody off, and you've been wanting to do it for years, and you did it. Now you got to go to confession. You don't want to say it in confession. I mean, you start, your misery starts almost immediately. See, it doesn't pay. If we could just stop for a few minutes, hey, what is it? I, I'm, okay, it's going to be hard for me. I'm going to bite my tongue. I'm going to squeeze my hands. I'm going to do anything. Count to ten. Say, Jesus, Mary, Joseph, whatever you want to say. But shut up. <laughs> <laughs> shut up. Now you can have more peace. See, you can walk away feeling, I have conquered this. I, I, I wanted to be like Jesus, and I was. See? Now I, I've got something. You keep blowing all the time. You're the one that's... Mis you know what's so bad? <laughs> Did you ever see some people on the... And I can say it. I'm old, too. I, old people, especially, they drive 25 miles an hour. <laughs> see? Just gone, real chill. Everybody behind it, you know, biting their tongue. They're, they're saying all kind of bad words. Just drive it away. You don't know everybody's behind you, swear it. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't know that. You're just going your way. Looking at there. Okay. There's a 18 wheeler behind you. <laughs> He's not looking around. He's not doing that at all. Now, the 18-wheeler ought to say, oh, look at that poor old gal. She can hardly see above that jury wheel. <laughs> I'm not going to scare her. So it takes me a few minutes. See, the, we have all kinds of reasons. We don't know we hurt people. We really don't. Nobody goes down the road at 30, 40 miles an hour and says, I want to make everybody miserable today. <laughs> I mean, you can get yourself run over. <laughs> Nobody does that. And I told you about the man that tooted dust, but Regina and I, oh, I was so mad. He comes along and he's, burr, burr. I said, what are you wrong? I said, We're on a two-lane two street. Where are you going to go? But he passes us. Okay, Jesus, I don't want to wish him ill. 
control yourself, Angelica. What's it worth? And I finally concluded it was worth nothing. <laughs> ah, but God took care. <laughs> When we got to the red light, there he was. <laughs> and I knew he's looking at me from that rear view mirror, and I went. <laughs> now that's a good way to get even. <laughs> See, I wasn't angry. The Lord took care of it. It doesn't always happen that way. <laughs> but ask yourself one question before you blow. Number one, maybe a couple questions. Would I do this if Jesus was standing right here? And what good will it do? Well, I got news for you. Jesus is standing right there. What good will it do? Probably none. Your neighbor will walk off not having the slightest idea he's a pain in the neck. And you're going to be riled up. You don't sleep at night. You've got to take Tums, Maalox, Jagdasil, and all the rest. And he's enjoying a pizza. <laughs> That don't make sense to me. If that makes sense to you, drink your Maalox. <laughs> well, anyway, God bless you. Be good now. Better yet, be holy. Bye. To order this episode of Mother Angelica Live Classics from the EWTN Religious Catalog web store, log on to EWTNRC.com 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, or call 1-800-854-6316. Hello, family. As you know, Advent is the time that the Church has set aside to help us prepare our hearts for Christmas. At EWTN, we have many Advent programs that we broadcast throughout the season. Every year, it's our hope that you'll grow closer to Christ before celebrating His birth at Christmas. And with your gift this Advent, EWTN can reach more souls with the truth of the eternal word. With every donation, you're helping someone who is lonely or depressed to hear the word of God. You're helping someone who is homebound to feel connected to the church you're helping a fallen away Catholic to discover, maybe for the first time, the true teachings of the faith. You're bringing Jesus to the world with each gift. And today, I hope that you'll help us tell the world about the infant in the major, the eternal word, Jesus Christ. Thank you for your prayers and for your support. May you have a blessed Advent. EWTN is 100% viewer supported. Please make a gift today by going to EWTN.com slash Advent Giving. You may also call us at 1-800-447-EWTN or send your donation to EWTN, 5817 Old Leeds Road, Irondale, Alabama, 35210. Christ and Christmas this year with holy reminders for those on your gift list. From seasonal ornaments and items for your home to a wide selection of gift giving ideas. Let EWTN Religious Catalog inspire your Christmas shopping. Log on to our website or call toll free at 1-800-854-6316. Buy Catholic. Shop today at EWTNRC.com.